Hello and welcome. My name is Manu Balachandran and you're watching me on Capital Ideas, Forbes India's latest podcast series where we talk to business leaders, entrepreneurs and CEOs on their insights into the world of business, the Indian economy, what it takes to be successful, facing challenges and failures along the way. We hope you enjoy these conversations as much as we did when we spoke to them. We are also available across podcast platforms including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Let's go speak to them. And welcome to Capital Ideas. My guest today goes by the name of Tiger in the business world. Tiger Tyagarajan is the president and CEO of Genpact, one of the world's largest business process management companies. Tiger is currently based in New York, leading the 3.5 billion dollar company with over 90,000 employees. A graduate in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology Mumbai and a master's degree holder in business administration from the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. Tiger has worked at some of the world's biggest companies including Unilever, Citibank and GE before heading a uh, Gen Bank. Tiger is especially passionate about diversity and serves on the board of Catalyst, a global non-profit organization working with some of the world's most powerful CEOs to help build workplaces that work for women. He was also one of the founding supporters of the US chapter of the 30% club which is committed to gender balance on boards of directors and in senior management. Welcome to Capital Ideas Tiger. Thank you Manu and uh, great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So let me begin uh, this conversation by asking you about the story behind the name Tiger. How did that uh, become your first name? uh it's a nickname uh so tiger is a nickname and um, it all started uh in second grade in bombay in the school i was going there uh, st theresa's high school in bandra um we uh in one of our english classes we uh, uh study the poem tiger tiger burning bright by william blake right we come out of the class and during the uh, lunch break a uh, few of my friends uh, surround me and say we're going to call you tiger because we can't pronounce your name okay. tyagarajan and uh, your eyes burn so i said okay and then you know 50 years later uh, because i always had someone who knew me by that name as i went through various stages of my life that name has just continued okay <laughs> fascinating Uh, but it's been it's been quite a remarkable journey from bombay to now mumbai to new york uh, take us through the early years uh, where you were you always a studious kid yeah i was a i was what one would call a studious kid um i loved uh, uh, solving problems right um i loved uh, particularly math and science problems um i loved doing well in academics I love beating people. Okay. Not 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 physically but academically. Right. Um and obviously at home um you know my my mom um was kind of pushed us in that direction. So the combination of I anyhow loved it but I also had a mom who pushed us in that direction. Right. Um actually made it all uh, made it all happen. No no different from many many stories of uh, similar households. in india over 50 years and today as well absolutely and then you went to iit bombay and then i am ahmedabad uh, straight up yeah it was a, it was a natural progression from uh, you know loving math uh, physics particularly uh, not not so much biology okay uh, to to obviously then saying it, it has to be the iits right giving the giving the entrance exam uh, then getting into iit bombay so right. all of those were almost like natural progression sometimes i look back and say what if that had not happened right um i don't think uh i really thought about what if it didn't happen okay it almost felt like of course it has to happen absolutely and and then you joined i think you started uh, your your career with uh, unilever soon after i am ahmedabad yeah so so after the iits i decided i wanted to do my mba Uh, okay. i did not want to go down the path of coming to the us for a masters or a phd which is what a lot of my friends did when they got out of iit uh, went to ahmedabad did my mba 
did not work between my engineering and MBA. In retrospect, uh, that's that's one thing I would I would recommend change. And I guess today most people work before they go to an MBA. At that time, I didn't. Right. Uh, and then um, joined uh, uh, sales and marketing in Pons. Uh, at that time, a pretty new listed uh, multinational company on the Indian Stock Exchange. Right. Uh, re- reasonably small, actually in, re- in, in hindsight, actually very small. Okay. Uh, but, but really considered to be one of the iconic brands to join if you are in sales and marketing in those days. And this is 1985. Absolutely. And, and what was the decision behind, you know, that gap year that you took? The gap year? Soon after MBA. Did you? No, I, I, no, I didn't take a gap year. It was straight out. No, of- no, in, fact, in fact, I didn't even take a gap day. Okay. Um, I remember I left campus on one evening from Ahmedabad. Uh, and then the next day morning, I was at uh, my first day of work in Bombay because I joined... Uh, Bonds in sales in Bombay. So I literally did not take one single day off. And has that continued even now? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the way I, uh, I love the work I do. I've always loved the work I do. I don't consider it to be work. Right. Um, I, have, I have a deep belief in Steve Jobs is to saying you love what you do and you do what you love. Right. If you love what you do and do what you love, then work is not work. Work is play. Work right. is life. And you kind of blend and mix the two. So um, I'm, uh, I, I guess one can say I'm always working, but I'm always not working. <laughs> but I'm sure, I mean, you know, were there moments early on in your professional life, you know, when you doubted what you were doing and maybe this was not your cup of tea, were there moments like that? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm a big believer in... Uh, in um, uh, thinking about things that I control okay. and um, finding a way to change those things to deliver whatever results I want. Hmm. Uh, I don't actually worry about things I don't control. Okay. And one of the things that you don't control is your past. Right. So I never look back and think about what should I have done differently? Why didn't I do that? Because that to me is dwelling in the past. Now that's different from spending time to learn from the past so that you can influence the future. Right. That's different. But I don't think about what if, what if, what if, I wish I had, I wish I had. I don't think that way. Right. Uh, so, so I've always looked at challenges placed and say, hey, how do I solve this problem? For me, everything is a problem to be solved. Okay. <laughs> so you went from Unilever then to Citibank. Yeah, I spent seven years in, uh, in Ponds. Okay. Uh, two years into Ponds, Ponds got acquired by uh, Unilever globally. Right. And, th- and therefore, in India, uh, in 1987, Ponds became a subsidiary of Hindustan Levers. Right. Uh, Ponds in India. And for a couple of years, actually three years, um, life did not change much. Okay. Um, Hindustan Lever left Ponds alone. I was in sales. I loved what I was doing. I was learning a lot. Um, I was getting to know uh, a lot about managing people, building teams, uh, driving results. Um, I spent the first five years in, uh, in Bombay and the next, or first four and a half years in Bombay and the next two and a half years in Chennai. Right. So I was, I was learning a lot, traveling around 25 days a month. Wow. Into, into the interiors of first the West region and then the South region. So I kind of know places that a lot of people haven't visited in India. Um, <laughs> and then towards the last year, year and a half, levers got more and more, uh, you know, part of, part of Ponds' uh, ecosystem. Right. And that's when I, I actually wanted to switch to levers because I wanted to be part of a bigger ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of didn't find uh, enough uh, support okay. within Ponds to allow me to go to Levers. It's probably the best way to say it. Okay. And actually, it taught me a big lesson. So I wasn't allowed to go to Levers because I was considered to be uh, doing really well and a, and a star in the Pond system. So the conversation with me was, you're doing so well. Why do you want to go to that big, that big pond? Right. Um, 
and you'll be a small fish in a big pond. And my, uh, and my reaction was, I want to be in a, a small fish in a big pond because when you're a small fish in a big pond, you can grow. Right. If, you're a, if you're a big fish in a small pond, there comes a time when you can't grow. Right. So, so I'm, a big, I'm a big believer that you have to allow people to uh, uh, explore their potential um, and not come in the way of exploring their potential. So I decided to quit. Um, and city bank and, uh, and I decided to quit and join financial services. Uh, most of my friends had joined financial services from I'm Um Consumer finance was really growing exponentially in India hmm. at that time. This was 1991. And uh, uh, there was a lot of demand for sales and marketing people coming from FMCG industry with sales and marketing background in FMCG industry to right. bring all of the learnings into consumer finance because the theory of the case was uh, the trick in India and consumer finance was going to be sales and distribution. Right. Which I kind of agreed with. That so was, that's, what, that's what got me to city. And that was also the time the government, uh, you know, the whole new economic policy had just been unleashed. So massive opportunity then. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and from Citibank, then you went to G. Yeah, so Citibank was an interesting two and a half year journey. Okay. Um, five jobs in two and a half years. Okay. Um, three cities in two and a half years. I joined in Chennai, then went to Bombay, then went to Delhi. Okay. I joined mortgage finance, then went to auto finance. I joined uh, sales in mortgage, then went to sales in, um, in uh, uh, auto, then moved to collections in auto then went to run uh, the collections business for, uh, for uh, the company, uh, for the bank, then moved to national auto business head. Um, so, so one of my learnings was uh, in that journey was uh, the, the speed at which you moved from one business to another business, one function to another function, one location to another location, and I thought in those days, Citibank did a great job doing that. And for me, the lesson was, it doesn't matter what you know or what you don't know. What matters is, do you have the potential to learn? Do you have the hunger to learn? Do you have the motivation to learn? And are you going to spend the time and effort to learn? And if that is the case, I don't really care what you know and don't know. I'm going to put you into a role that you can, you know, you can do something with and go learn it. Uh, because you have leadership skills that I want. So I've become a big believer since those days. So this is seven or eight years into my career. Right. That when I interview people today for big jobs in the company, I do not spend even one second in a two-hour interview okay. talking about the skills they have, uh, the experience they have, uh, the specific – I mean, if it's finance, the finance skills they have or the marketing skills they have, because I really don't think it matters. Right. Because what they know today is going to change tomorrow. So right. I really want to understand, uh, can they learn? Uh, do they have an ego that prevents them from learning? Do they think that they know it all? At the age of 60, if you wake up in the morning and say, I know nothing, that's the person I want. Absolutely. So how do you do, so in that sense, do you think leadership uh, per se can be cultivated or is it, you know, does it naturally come to people? I'm a big believer that everything can be cultivated. So in the, in the whole argument of genetics versus, uh, versus nature, nature versus nurture, of course, genes play a role. Of course, nature plays a role. But does it play a 5% role, 10% role? Uh, you know, the more I learn, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a big avid reader of uh, genetic evolution and um, how the brain evolves and what it does, etc. And the more I learn about it, the more I realize that there is genetic predisposition, but that predisposition is like switches. Right. And nature uh, just sets up those switches. Uh, the way you grow up and your interactions and your, uh, and your experiences and your influence and what you do decides whether the switch goes on or off. Hmm. So to me, um, you know, all your life experiences determine and your learnings 
determine ultimately who you are and what you become um, on top of what you start with, which is your genes. Absolutely. And so from Citibank, you moved on to G. Uh, that was, again, a big move. That yeah, you so 1994, uh, you know, G Capital was coming into the country. Right. Uh, I was, I was uh, introduced, I think, through some readings to Jack Welch's uh, books. Um, uh, Control Your Destiny was the first book I read. Right. Uh, and uh, I actually fell in love with uh, the company. Okay. I fell, in, I fell in love with some of Jack's, Jack Welch's views on leadership. Right. Uh, and on the kind of things that he talked about to run the company. Um, it also fascinated me that you can be in a business that has a credit card lending business, has a business that makes aircraft engines, right. has a business that makes ultrasound and uh, you know, MR equipment, has a business that makes power plants, has a business that makes light bulbs, has a business that lends you know, $100 million to a large enterprise. And I said, what kind of a business does so many different things? And I said, how cool it would be to join a company right. that actually you can build a 50 year career uh, and never leave the company. Right. And yet do a hundred different things and learn a hundred different things without leaving the company. Right. And Jack Welch's view about leadership was that, that, you know, you don't need to know stuff. You need to be hungry to learn stuff. And he talked about cultivating leaders in the company right. and he would move, move people from 15 years in credit cards. Now go and do something in aircraft engines. Very few companies even today do that. Uh, I am a big believer that actually there is value in doing that. So did you have to try, did you try your hands at uh, different uh, areas in that sense? So I never get an, got an opportunity to work directly Right. In, an, in an industrial business in GE. But within GE Capital, which is where I joined, I uh, worked in uh, initially auto finance and consumer finance, unsecured. Then I worked in uh, uh, a little bit of credit cards. Okay. And then uh, five years after joining in 1999, I moved when uh, this business that today I'm part of, Genpak, used to be called Jekis, GE Capital International Services. And we were 300 people okay. uh, inside GE. And we were serving all the GE businesses. Oh, that was the vision. Right. So, you know, one of the joys of, of that move uh, into Jekis, the precursor of Genpak, was that I could work with every GE business, with every part of the globe of GE, with every function of GE, I could interact with every leader in GE. That was my dream. My dream was I could have five meetings in a day. One meeting was with aircraft engines, second meeting with GE Healthcare, third meeting with NBC. By that time, GE had acquired NBC. Right. Uh, third meeting with NBC, fourth meeting with uh, GE credit cards. Um, next day morning at four o'clock in the morning, you wake up and do a discussion with Australia. One hour later, you do a discussion with Japan. I mean that, and all of that sitting in uh, in uh, Gurgaon. Okay. Uh, you didn't have to. Leave, you didn't have to travel every day. Uh, you didn't have to even leave the country. And yet, you were dealing with the world, and you were dealing with all businesses. You were learning new things that are happening in those parts of the world. So you were ahead. I mean, how could one get anything better if if your objective uh, was driven by? Learning, learning, and learning. Only one objective, learn. So you were, you were part of the initial 300 people who essentially started Genpak then? Yeah, so I was, not, I was not the initial first 300 starting group. Right. Uh, Pramod, uh, who used to run G Capital at that time, started the business um, along with a couple of leaders who he, who he gave the responsibility to start. But by the time it was 300 people, which is a year later, uh, it was 300 people. Uh, I moved into that business to basically run the business. Um, his, I think his thinking at that time was I would take that business and scale it uh, and make it bigger. Um, 
he his discussion with me was build a team for the future, which means you take a business at 300 people and bring leaders, not for a 300 people business, right. but for a business, but for a business 10 times its size. So the first thing I did in the first 90 days of moving to that business in the late um, 1998, early 99 period was um, to hire 10 leaders into the company. Okay. Great, great leaders. And the story for them was you are not joining a company with 300 people uh, with this much revenue. You're joining a company with 10 times the size, 10 times the revenue, 10 times the people. And that's the vision that people bought into. Right. And Remember that meant that meant that people were buying into a vision of three thousand people. Absolutely. Today we are today we are a hundred thousand people. That's so. <laughs> and and but but I'm sure you know the whole business of Genpack itself has undergone some massive transformation from that 1999 period to today. Uh, how is that uh, shaped up for Genpack? The initial days must have been just focused on G. No, the initial six and a half years was focused only on GE, seven years. Right. Until January 1, 2005, the only business we did was GE. Hmm. Um, but one of the advantages we had was while we, did, uh, while we did business and work with one company, right. actually we did business with 75 businesses. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, we did business with every part of the world. We did business with a variety of businesses that had no connection with each other. Financial services, insurance, uh, engines, power and energy, healthcare, uh, entertainment. I mean, which company in the world allowed you to do business with one company, but actually all kinds of businesses. So, so one of the, one of the interesting things is while we were part of one company, actually we were not part of one company. Right. We were part of a hundred companies. We were part of a hundred businesses. We were part of a hundred countries. And that is one of the things that I think uh, made us learn so much more than if we had been part of one company, one insurance company or one bank or one airlines company. Uh, if we were born that way, we would have learned one thing. Right. We were born as part of a company where we had the opportunity to learn a hundred things. And that was what all our people did. So right from the beginning, the single biggest culture we drove in the company was a culture of learning. Right. We decided the only thing that matters for our business was learn. And, and if, you ask, if you ask me today, what is the culture of the company? There's only one culture in the company. It is an insatiable appetite to learn a hunger to learn and a desire to learn. And uh, uh, curiosity is the, is the characteristic that we look for in people. If you're not curious in Genpak, you're dead. And, and, and all of them who come to join, you know, this huge, I mean, there are so many different areas. How difficult is it for people to sort of process all of that? Well, people start in, uh, in, in normally one or two areas. Uh, so when you, not, when you join, particularly if you join at the uh, junior mid-level, then you join a particular industry, you join a particular set of accounts in that industry. So if you're joining consumer goods retail, then you're joining consumer goods retail in that industry. Uh, we, uh, we have a set of fabulous retail and consumer brands we work with. Right. Um, and when you join one of them, you really go deep into that industry. If you join uh, the banking capital markets business, then you go deep into one of the clients in that business. So we are big believers that you be must become an expert in the industry that you serve, but that doesn't mean you have to come from there. Right. You got to learn. And then after five years, you might say, hey, I want to learn something else because I'm going to take the learnings from consumer goods retail. So let's say, um, one of the big learnings when you move from a bank to a consumer goods retail that we have used is banks know how to assess credit of small businesses. Banks know how to lend to small businesses, right. small and medium enterprises. Banks know how to manage a portfolio of small business enterprises. 
Banks know how to collect from small and medium enterprises. You walk into a manufacturing company, you walk into a consumer goods company, they do not know how to assess credit of their suppliers. Right. They do not know how to assess credit of their customers. They do not know how to collect money from their customers. Of course, they do all of that, but it's not sophisticated. Hmm. When we work with them, we bring sophistication of financial services thinking to consumer goods retail. So I do not want a consumer goods retail person to continue in consumer goods retail forever. I do not want a banking person to continue in banking forever. So people move around, Absolutely. they learn. And now you can decide to go deeper and deeper and deeper in your industry, that's also fine. So you have multiple career paths. Some people take the path of, uh, I'm very good at finance and I'm gonna do finance in one industry and go deep. Then I'm gonna do finance in another industry and go deep and deep and deep. So different industries, but finance. I'm gonna go supply chain. I really understand supply chain and I'm gonna go deep in supply chain in multiple industries. I'm gonna go deep in AI and machine learning and I'm gonna use it in multiple industries. On the other hand, I can say I'm gonna go deep into insurance hmm. and I'm gonna deeply understand underwriting. Then I'm gonna understand claims and I'm gonna connect understanding of claims to understanding of underwriting. I'm gonna understand how you sell to a broker. So how do you make that experience of selling for our customers much better? And you make that better by understanding how underwriting is done, how claims is done. That is someone who goes deep into insurance. So there are multiple career paths that people can take. Fascinating. And you became the CEO in 2011. And what I've noticed is that, you know, revenues have more than doubled uh, during, that, during that period from 2011. So what, what changes did you bring about uh, in, in, during this period? So when I joined, uh, when, I, when I took over as the CEO in 2011, the company was doing well. Okay. Um, I, was, I was part of the company from the beginning, as I described. Right. Um, a lot of the team, I've been involved in hiring and, and, and staffing and putting together. So, and the strategy of the firm uh, and the company was well articulated, well defined, and we were growing really well. Of course, we are just uh, still going through the global financial crisis. 2011, uh, our industry, because we're a long cycle industry, had still, uh, was still feeling the impact of the global financial crisis of 2009, 2010, hmm. uh, because you know, when, you, when you're not doing new deals in 2009, 2010, your revenue is not growing enough in 2011. Absolutely. So, so I took over at the time when the global financial crisis impact was still being felt, but the team was great, the business was great, we were doing very well, uh, and so on. Um, so there was not really that much that needed to change overnight. Okay. There were a few things that I had a, a perspective that after six years of being an independent company from 2005 to 2011, uh, we had reached a size and scale and evolution that I thought it was ready for change. Uh, and the few things that I th said immediately I want to change are, number one, uh, I said the company must be organized by industry verticals. Hmm. Because I'm a, I was a big believer that we have to get closer and closer to the customer. Right. Um, if you're a horizontal, you're not as close to the customer. If you're a vertical, then you're becoming closer and closer to the customer because you're organized the way the customer is organized. Right. And, uh, and the fulcrum of that organization is the customer and a set of those customers belonging to an industry is the way we are organized. So today I have a leader who runs insurance and she has a set of clients in the insurance business hmm. and all of them are organized around insurance. So that is one big change that we did. Right. The other change that I decided had to be done was uh, I said the company cannot be run from delivery centers. The company cannot be run from where we provide the service. Um, BMW doesn't run from its factory. Absolutely. Toyota doesn't run from its factory. The leaders of BMW and the leaders of Toyota are people who sit in the markets where clients are. So I basically told my team, 
that 80% of the team today sits in uh, delivery centers. Okay. Within, within three years, 80% of the team, uh, leadership team, must sit in markets closer to the customer. And I said, tomorrow morning, I am relocating to New York. This company will be run from the market, uh, okay. the largest market, which is the US. And I'll be sitting in New York and will run the company from there. Uh, and I said, in three years, I expect 80% of the leadership team to be in the markets. Nine months later, 80% of the team was in the market. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so that was yeah. one aspect of it. I mean, creating horizontal uh, sort of, you know. Uh, vertical, vertical. Vertical, sorry. Vertical. Vertical. Yes, sorry. So we, were, we were already very strong in horizontals. Okay. We were strong in finance. We were strong in IT. We were strong in analytics. We were strong in sourcing and procurement. Uh, but we had started really building capabilities in industry specific uh, services. And I thought the future was going to be about really being industry specific and getting closer to our clients. Hmm. So that was industry vertical. Second action was all leaders should be in the market. They should spend time in markets. Uh, the third action was uh, when you have leaders in the markets, markets is a plural. Right. So it is not one market, it's markets. Therefore, there is no one center of gravity of the company. Right. And I said, what is the meaning of headquarters? It means nothing. So on the 17th of June, 2011, we eliminated headquarters. Okay. Uh, yeah. So since 2011, um, June 17th, uh, Genpak has had no headquarters. Interesting. Uh, so if someone asks me, what's the headquarters of the company? And my answer is that we don't have a headquarters. Because <laughs> when the leadership team of the company, 20 people are distributed across 10 cities in um, five countries, then what is the meaning of headquarters? So we used to get together regularly, uh, physically once a quarter, virtually once a month, uh, often uh, once a week on uh, calls. Soon they became video conferences. Um, so when COVID-19 happened, hmm. the, for us, life didn't change. Right. We've, always, we've always been virtual. We've always been distributed. We've always used uh, Zoom. Um, we were one of the first users of Zoom five years back. Wow. Yep. We were named by Zoom as one of the top 10 enterprises in the world for Zoom last year. So for us, at the leadership level, at the way we run the company, there is no change. <laughs> right. <laughs> COVID-19 hasn't changed that anything. However, obviously, operations, uh, which used to be run in, uh, you know, in each of the operating centers in Gurgaon, in Bucharest, in Dalian, in uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, in Richardson, Texas, those have moved to work from home. So right. that change happened. But running the company for the leaders of the company virtually, no change. Right. And, and this is something, I, you know, I was going through your balance sheet last year and it said, you know, your total BPO revenue was about 84% of the total revenue, uh, while the IT revenues was about 16% of the total revenue. Do you reckon this will change as the company moves uh, forward in the coming years? So we do not, we do not count revenue that way. Okay. That is, that is a wrong way to count revenue. Okay. Uh, there is no such thing as BPO. There is no such thing as IT. Okay. But we don't run the company that way. We don't have an IT leader of the company. Okay. We have a banking leader. We have an insurance leader. We have a consumer's retail leader. We have a life sciences healthcare leader. Right. We have a high tech leader. We have an industrial manufacturing leader. We have a GE leader. Right. We have those leaders. We have a finance and accounting leader. We have a leader for supply chain. We have a leader for um, all the enterprise resource planning ERPs. Right. We have a leader for digital technologies. We have a leader for experienced technologies. We have a leader for, those are uh, a mixture of things that provide the solution. Right. Uh, and by the way, since 2005, that is the way we run the company. So it's not new. Okay. We have, we have always said the definition that the industry uses of BPO and IT 
is the wrong definition. Okay. So it's not new. We've always said the way you should think about our, our business is solutions. Right. It's like saying, so most of the, most of the audience of this podcast, I think are going to be in India. So they're going to understand this. If you say, I want biryani. Okay. Then I want biryani. I don't want rice. Right. I don't want peas. I don't want mutton separately. Absolutely. I want it all mixed up. And my success as a customer is going to be when the taste of biryani is perfect. Right. I don't care if the rice is great or the mutton is great. I don't really care. The mixture has to be great. So similarly, the customer wants a problem to be solved. I want my business to grow by 40%. Hmm. How are you going to help me grow by 40%? Well, I'm going to find a way to get your loan approval process to go from 22 days for small business lending to three hours. Okay. How are we going to, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by actually changing the process, running the process differently by uh, doing the process from a central location. Hmm. Let's say it's from Jaipur. Um, and all of that people call BPO. Right. But that is not what we do. We do more than that. When we do that, I'm going to bring in AI. I'm going to change the way uh, the technology works on the underlying platform. I'm going to change the experience of the people by actually putting it on the cloud. Hmm. Hmm. All of that is what I give as a solution. Right. And the customer pays me based on whether I deliver real value, which is has 22 days become three hours. Right. right. So where is BPO in this? Where is analytics in this? Where is technology in this? Where is IT in this? It's all mixed up. Right. So, so, so I know that the industry counts 86 and 84% and all. We don't count it that way. Interesting, interesting. Thing. 93% of the work we do, 93% of the work we do has digital technologies embedded in it somewhere. Right. Uh, that's the way we think about it. So for us, when we go to a customer, we don't have a BPO person going to a customer, an IT person going to a customer. Hmm, hmm. We have a mixture of people going to a customer. Right. When we have a solution that is being created, to solve a problem, it is often 17 people together. And so, often those 17 people are in 10 different cities in the world. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Maybe the technology that we are using is the technology that we acquired from uh, the company called p and Soft right. that, is, that is headquartered in Tel Aviv. So maybe one of the people of the 17 is sitting in Tel Aviv. Right. Maybe one other person is, is the acquisition that we did from Rage Frameworks in Boston. So sitting in Boston. Uh, maybe there are three people who run operations and process sitting in uh, Jaipur. There are three client-facing people right. sitting, in, uh, sitting in Pennsylvania, which is where the client is. Right. And right. That's, how we create, that's how we create solutions over five days of workshops done virtually. By the way, this description is not a COVID-19 description. Absolutely. This, descri this description is the last 10 years description. This is how we create solutions. So, so, so what has COVID done, uh, you know, for you and, you know, you deal with so many businesses around the world. So essentially what has it uh, done for people? So obviously the change to work from home was a dramatic change. Right. Uh, it, ha it happened overnight for our clients. Right. And it happened overnight for us. Um, a lot of our clients were not ready, uh, so they had to scramble. Right. Uh, they were not ready. They were not ready, both from a technology perspective. Right. So they could not necessarily access everything from home. Right. But that is not a problem. You can set it up. The real problem was they were culturally not ready. Right. And a lot of other companies were ready culturally. Right. Similar. Similarly, in our industry. Uh, there are companies that were uh, not ready culturally, 
most of our companies, most of our industry was ready from a technology perspective. But that's not the differentiator. The differentiator is, are you culturally ready to run the company virtually? Hmm, hmm. And some companies in our industry were ready to do that. Some companies were not. We were really geared to do that because we've always been doing it in a, in a very interesting way. So that's one big change. Uh, that settled down. People are now, our clients are working from home. We are working from home. It's all virtual. So that culture uh, has come in now? It's a, it's a learning for people. Okay. Uh, some people are thriving in it. Some people are, are, are not thriving. Right. Um, so there is a deep desire to come back to the office with some clients. Okay. Uh, and some clients are saying, hey, this is working. Right. So it's a, it's a mixture. Uh, I think there are five trends okay. that are very important trends that every one of our clients, um, I think, is undertaking. Okay. It doesn't matter which industry. It doesn't matter which industry. Trend number one is offline to online. Right. Uh, all industries, all customers in every industry are jumping from offline to online. Um, if an industry had a 5% penetration of online business, that has become 20%. If an industry had 20% penetration, that's become 40%. Okay. So much more online than before. The second is uh, most of our clients are accelerating the journey to the cloud. Cloud solutions, SaaS solutions, uh, technology on the cloud, services on the cloud. Um, they were anyhow moving in that direction, hmm. but now they are accelerating it exponentially. The third is uh, virtualization. So everyone wants to be able to do work from anywhere, anytime, on any device. Obviously, the more you move to the cloud, the more you can do virtualization. Right. The fourth, the fourth is the desire to get real-time analytics has exponentially grown. Uh, volatility is, is very high in the world. Right. Uh, demand volatility, supply volatility of everything. Forecasting is much more real time these days, which means you got to do analytics real time. Right. Now, if you, have, if you have a lot of cloud in the way you orchestrate data and technology and work and uh, information, and if you have everything that is virtual and on any device from anywhere, then you can do a lot more real-time predictive analytics on any device at any time. Um, and then the fifth trend is all of this requires experience to be much better. Right. Because if user experience is bad, if employee experience is bad, if I'm sitting at home and I'm trying to access all these technologies and help my customer or help my consumer, and if the experience is bad or the customer's experience is bad, then they're not gonna use it. Right. So experience is a big trend. So it's online to offline, cloud, virtualization, real-time analytics, and experience. But, uh, and those, uh, and uh, those five trends, every company is jumping onto. So uh, we call that digital transformation. And companies that were on a five-year journey to digitally transform themselves are saying, I wanna get it done in two years. So right. speed has become a big thing. Speed, everything is speed. So, so do you have to work overtime now with so many companies looking to make the transition? Yeah, I guess uh, you can say that we are activity level has gone up dramatically. Okay. Uh, uh, travel is obviously down right. dramatically. I mean, there's no travel. So as a result, uh, to some extent, more time is available for that activity hmm, hmm. Uh, because there's less travel, there's more time. Right. Uh, but, but the time is filled up with activity. There's a lot of activity. I mean, the number of client conversations has gone up five times. Wow. Not, not 50%, 5X. Wow. Uh, the number of conversations with boardrooms and C-suite has gone up 10 times. Uh, it, all it takes is to set up a Zoom call. Absolutely. Or a Microsoft Teams call. Or, a, you know, there's so many technologies. Right. Um, so you jump from one call to another and you keep, keep making progress and progress is done in fast cycles. It's all agile. It's all, uh, it's all sprints. No one talks about in the next one year, let's do this. No, right. it's what are we going to do for the next 45 days? Then let, let's do something next, then next, then next, then next. Mm -hmm. So it's a very fast cycle. 
So activity is up. Uh, yeah, you can call. Uh, people are working a lot. Uh, people are stretched. Right. That does that does create uh, stress. Um, obviously, people are not meeting people socially. That right. creates stress. People but, are at home, and home is sometimes crowded. That creates stress. Right. So, but but are companies you know spending money now? I mean, are they are they financially well equipped to actually splurge money on on all of this, even though they are necessary right now? So I don't know if, first of all, it's splurging. Um, uh, the, the difference between these technologies uh, and these digital transformation journeys and the old multi-year technology journey of the past is that these are not uh, billion dollar spends right. that, you si that you sign off and say five years later, let's see if it works. These are next 45 days, next 45 days, next 45 days, next three months, next three months. Right. So... So the answer to your question is, I think there's a tremendous amount of motivation to, to uh, spend money uh, hmm. in order to get immediate return. Right. Uh, and, and the answer to that is, of course, yes, because that is, that is sensible to do. It right. is not, and therefore I wouldn't put, use the word splurging. Right. Um, I think anything that has a very long payback, people are not spending. Right. Um, all digital transformations have much faster payback and you can do them in sprints and you can do them like a mushroom. Right. So you can do, you can do three projects and 90 days later, each of those projects become three each. So that becomes nine projects. One year later, you're doing 81 projects. Yeah. Three into three, nine, nine into three, 27, 27 into three, 81. Right. You're then doing 81 projects. Uh, and all of them are are uh, expected to give some payback. And if they don't, then you kill it. Right. So you, you, you don't have a problem if you try something and if it doesn't work in three months, then you kill it. It's fine. So that is the other thing that's happening. So we are, you know, we are, uh, companies are, are hyperactive. Why? Two reasons. Hmm. One, there is a deep desire to change. Right. Because it's existential. Absolutely. So that's why it's not about splurging. It's about, am I going to change or not? If I don't change, I'm dead. Right. So when someone is given the option of either dying or changing, they change. <laughs> right. <Sure>. So <laughs> the, the second is the opportunity. Those who change and grab onto this change in this window are going to grow more. Uh, there are companies that are growing during these times at 20%. Wow. Some of our, some of our clients are growing at 20% uh, because they've grabbed onto this. Obviously their industries are, are, are the kind of industries that are doing well. Uh, but, but even within those industries, there are clients who are growing at 3% and clients who are growing at 20%. The hmm. difference between them is pretty clear. Uh, those who are willing to change, those who have a culture of change, those who have a culture of experimenting, those who have a culture of digital transformation, those who are willing to break silos within their organization, um, all of those, uh, and those who leverage a partnership ecosystem, right. then, then trying to do everything themselves. Right. Because when you do everything yourself, aren't you making an assumption that you know everything? Absolutely. And didn't I say that when you wake up in the morning, you have to wake up saying, I don't know anything. Right. So to me, to me, anyone who does not partner, and thinks they don't need partners, they can do it all themselves, uh, is a person who has ego and ultimately they'll have a problem. Right. Uh, you know, in this whole post sort of COVID world, uh, how much does really location matter? That is one bit I want to know. And, you know, the traditional hierarchies that we have followed in companies, would that also undergo some sort of transformation in the coming years? So, so Manu, the, 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 the two words that we actually... Uh, don't like in any case our hierarchy and location. <laughs> right. And it's not new. It's not new. It's a deep philosophical view that I have. And it's a deep philosophical view that a lot of our leaders have, right. which is location doesn't matter. Right. Uh, when we hire people across the company, uh, we've never looked at their location. Hmm. So my chief marketing officer, she 
for five years has been based in Boston. Right. I'm in New York. My HR leader is in, uh, is in Gurgaon. Right. My chief digital officer is in Palo Alto in, uh, in the West Coast. Right. Uh, my um, uh, CFO is in Philadelphia. Right. He's in Pennsylvania. So, so location has never mattered <laughs> for <Right>. us. <laughs> and, and the world is realizing that actually location doesn't matter. Right. Our business has been built on location doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first quarter of 2020, March 31st quarter close, for 200 plus companies, we closed the books of those companies for first quarter. We were working from home and our clients were working from home. And we closed the books of global publicly listed companies. Right. And they all closed okay. on time, on time, 98% of them closed before time. Right. And they all closed perfectly. Interesting. Uh, and, yeah. and they were all because of the belief that location doesn't matter. And hierarchy, we've had a pretty clear view that flat organizations uh, are the organizations of the future. Um, uh, any one of the 100,000 people in the company can reach me and talk to me. Right. That's the way we've run the company for 20 years. So it's not new. Um, and that applies to all levels in the company. Um, we do... Um, we do an amazing amount of communication and the communication is not hierarchical communication. Right. So I often do a hundred thousand people town halls very often. Um, you know, I have my team talking to my board. Okay. Without me, without me being there. Right. That's the way we are. Uh, and therefore, uh, to your question, I think the world is going to become democratized much more on access to information, right. access to data, access to tools, access to technology, access to analytics. Democratization is real. It's been there for a number of years uh, because digital technologies and cloud allows democratization. COVID-19 has forced that to an accelerated exponential curve. Right. So now, now it's much more true. Absolutely. And you're, you're particularly passionate about diversity in the boardroom and in the workplace. Now, uh, do you think, you know, COVID-19 and of course the ease of working from anywhere has actually improved, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hiring for women? So I'm a big believer in diversity uh, of all kinds, at all levels, um, everywhere for one big reason. Right. And the reason is, if you have 20 people in the room uh, trying to solve a problem, I want 20 minds trying right. to solve a problem. I don't want 20 bodies, but one mind. Because I have 20 bodies and 20 minds, but actually they all think the same way. In which case, basically I have 20 bodies, but one mind. Absolutely. I want 20 bodies and 20 minds, which means each mind should be different, which means each mind should think differently. Absolutely. Which means cognitive diversity is the most important diversity to go after. Hmm, hmm. How do you get cognitive diversity? You get cognitive diversity by getting two types of diversities that drive cognitive diversity. Diversity of genetics, <laughs> going back to the beginning of the conversation, and, diverse, and diversity of experience. Nature diversity and nurture diversity. So which means you need gender diversity. You need racial diversity. You need global ethnic diversity. Right. You need location diversity. You need industry diversity. You need, what have you done in your past? I've done finance. I've done marketing. I've done this. Okay. Join this project uh, because you will bring finance and uh, marketing uh, even though the project is an HR project. Absolutely. Which oh, but I don't know. I don't know anything in HR. No, no. That's why I wanted to join the project. So, right. so we have. We've always been big believers in cognitive diversity, and right. therefore we've driven 
uh, diversity a lot. One of the big diversities that I thought uh, was an important one to drive is the single most obvious diversity that one should drive in the world that applies in every nook and corner in the world, which is gender diversity. Absolutely. The world is, the world is close to 50-50 uh, in diversity, in population. However, uh, companies are not 50-50, leadership teams are not 50-50, yeah. sales teams are not 50-50, consulting teams are not 50-50, and boards are not 50-50. Until we get to 50-50, we do not have cognitive diversity of gender. But, but like, like I was asking earlier, would you know, COVID-19 and being location agnostic uh, actually help improve that situation then? So, so the answer is yes, but I would say there's one problem that we have to solve. So the answer is yes. The okay. moment you have location agnostic uh, teams, the moment clients and us and all of us basically say it is okay if uh, one of my people uh, wants to uh, not be in Delhi, right. but actually work for one year from Lucknow, okay. for whatever reason, uh, and the person can do that work from Lucknow, I should be fine. Absolutely. Uh, and therefore, flexibility dramatically increases because of what we've learned through COVID-19. The moment you increase flexibility, you open up the ability for more people to be engaged in, um, in leadership in work and employment in all kinds of industries. The moment you say you do not need to come to office, hmm. travel two hours a day to travel and come to office every day, you open up many more people to say, yep, I'm ready to work with you. Uh, so that is a big opportunity to uh, increase diversity. But there's one problem. Okay. And, and we are very excited about that. So we're going to do that. But there's one problem that is, that is a COVID-19 problem, uh, virtual work problem that we have to solve. Okay. And it's probably true across the globe. It's true in some places more than others, which is when people work from home, there are pressures at home. That are, that are different. Right. Uh, uh, if you have kids at home that are also doing uh, education from home, then that creates pressure. Hmm. If you have uh, to be at home and you're expected to run the home while you're working because of social pressure. So for example, in India, right. I know that when women work from home, uh, there is pressure in the home. Say, oh, you're at home, then you can do some work. No, no, I, I'm, I'm at home, but I'm actually working with Genpak or I'm working with whoever. Um, but you're at home. So you should be able to do this work and that work. That creates pressure, that creates stress. Or if uh, children are at home and they're not going to school and they're doing uh, online classes, then you need to support them when they're at home when they're doing online classes. Right. That creates pressure and unfortunately, that pressure I've, I knew, but I can see is falling more on women. So there is a danger that COVID-19 makes some women leave the workforce. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have to be really, really careful that that does not happen. Because if that happens, then it's really tragic. Sure. Um, so we are very clear that we are, we are doing many things going above and beyond to prevent that from happening. Um, so as long as that doesn't happen and, the, and all of us rally around that not happening, big danger of that happening. By the way, it can happen even in the US in more developed economies as well. Right. Um, because in the US it's even worse in terms of health, there's no help. Um, there's no joint families. There's no, I can depend on my parents to look after my children while I'm working at home. That doesn't exist. Uh, that easily. So then uh, it is possible that some women might say, look, I'm, I can't come to, I can't work now. Right. So we have to be much more conscious of much more flexibility uh, because women are working from home and sometimes the pressure of this falls on women. Otherwise, what is a benefit of accessing more diverse uh, population, including racial diversity, by the way, so mm -hmm. we can get really strong uh, 
black African American, Latino black uh, population that we want to increase right. in in the U.S. Um, access to that population can actually increase because we can go to communities that otherwise normally we would not have an operating center, hire people there, and they can continue to do work where they are without actually having to move to one of our operating centers. So there are some benefits, but you have to solve this other problem. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I know we are well past one hour, so I just have yeah, one yeah. Uh, for you, which is, uh, you know, what would be your advice to young people, people who are in profession now to build a successful career for themselves? Focus all your attention on learning. Understand uh, what, what being curious means. Right. And try and live it every day in your life both at work and personally. What that means is if someone disagrees with you on a topic, do not uh, pounce on that person and say, I disagree with you. Right. Find out why they have a view that is opposite of yours. So the most important question to ask is why. Uh, the most important question to ask is driven by I want to understand why you think the way you think. That to me, if, 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 if as young uh, people entering the workforce, you can inculcate that in yourself and you can inculcate that in your teams, hmm. then you drive a learning culture. Then you live your life as a lifelong learner. Right. And if you live your life as a lifelong learner, you will exploit the full potential of what you could become. Right. Otherwise, you will limit the potential of what you could become. Uh, automatically, you will not be an egoist. Automatically, you will become more humble. Automatically, you will be more inclusive. Automatically, you will drive diversity. Automatically, you will build bigger teams. You will solve bigger problems. You will produce better results. And you will build a great, great career. So it's actually very simple. Just right. be more curious and have a build a deep desire and hunger to learn every day, every minute. Right. <laughs> right. So on that note, uh, we would like to express our gratitude, uh, sincere gratitude actually for joining us today from, you know, taking time off from your busy schedule uh, and taking us through this remarkable journey, the future of work and lessons for young you know, people who are entering the workforce. Uh, we wish you the best uh, and Genpak and also in, uh, in, in a staying safe. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. It has been a fabulous, fabulous discussion. <laughs> fabulous discussion and uh, very energizing. And yeah. as, the first, as the first meeting of the day, uh, I, I now have energy to go through the balance of the, yeah. of the day. All the best, Tiger. And thank you so much for thank joining you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.